A Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you another inspiring true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Listen to the true dramatic story of an actual person who, because of his courage and achievement, is honored tonight on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Presented by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame to men and women whose service, sacrifice, and devotion have made our own lives. And we know all ice. Cool, cold, refreshing ice. What would you do without it? But for ages, the tropics did without it. Our own South did without it. Unthinkable, you say? Well, that's the way it was until a New Englander named Frederick Tudor thought about it. He thought about it, and, and he did something about it. And what he, for adventure, it certainly was. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying Hallmark on the back when you select it for words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste. Let the hallmark on the back be your guide. For that hallmark tells your friends, you care enough to send the very best. Lyle Goldwyn Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture, Young Bess, starring Gene Simmons, Stuart Granger, Deborah Carr, and Charles Lawton. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you the first act of our Hallmark Hall of Fame. In 1804, President Trump for the United States, the great Louisiana Territory. Two years later, in a New Orleans garden, a young man named Frederick Tudor of Boston promised a girl that he'd come back for her soon. He was going to Boston to settle down from globe trotting. He'd, he'd make his mark and come back for her the following year. Well, he never came back. Because the following year, the girl, Eugenie, was dead of yellow fever. Boston, the winter of 1810. In the violet, wintry dusk, two ice skaters warmed themselves before a fire. One of the men's Frederick Tudor. The other's his brother, William. The last Eugenie is there, too, in Frederick's memory forever. Oh, how cold it gets toward evening. Well, evening's the only time we can go skating. Well, that won't be much longer. Yes. Ice is about ready to cut, I suppose. Mm hmm. Well, that's life, though. You finally get a good surface for skating, and somebody cuts it right out from under you. Well, you find somebody you'd like to spend your life with, then Fred. Now, Fred, you've got to stop thinking about Eugenie. <laughs> Vive le président Jefferson, she used to say. She gave him the credit for bringing us together. She believed absolutely in the protection of the American flag. The army is shooting off cannons that will surely blow away the fever mist, she wrote me. Fred, look, what's the good of brooding? She died burning with fever, and we mutter about the cold. Burning fever and delirium, and with artillery for a requiem. And we complain of cold. A handful of this snow, this 
snow to her burning lips would have meant so much to her. Well, Fred, it, it couldn't save her. It could have given her some comfort. You can't move fever victims north, Fred. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we, we can bring the north to them. Bring the... Well, what do you mean? <laughs> I don't know. You can't transport snow. No, ice, then. Or ice. Well, I don't know. Well, I do, Fred. You can't. Now, listen. Why is there so much illness in the tropics? Hmm? Well, maybe because there's no ice to preserve food properly. You remember when we were in uh, Fort of France in Martinique? Well, yes. How warm and unpleasant everything tasted? How sick I was from some spoiled food? Oh, wait a minute, Fred. It, that wasn't yellow fever. I know, uh, but... If there were ice in the tropics for good practical reasons, nobody would grudge some ice for the fevered, too, would they? <laughs> I see. There was always method in your wildest dreaming, Fred. No. Well, call it a dream if, if it's a dream to be of some use to the world we live in, and call it a dream. I couldn't help you, Jenny. No one could. But... Perhaps inspired by her, I can help others. I'm not a doctor, a great teacher. I have no particular gifts. How does a man with no particular gifts help others? He gets, gets an idea. Perhaps sentimentally inspired. The whole world may laugh at it. <laughs> His own brother calls it a dream. In this case, Fred. In this case, your own brother is ready to invest all his savings in your dream. Thank you, Will. You know, I, I have some money. And I'm sure Father would help. Now, just think of it, Will. New England ice all over the world, wherever it's needed. We, we, we'll be pioneers. But uh, where will we start? Um, what's the matter with Martinique? Hmm? We've been there. We, we know people there. They know us. Will, we send our first cargo of ice to Martinique. Spring. The big mystic river out of Boston Harbor wallows in a furious tropical storm. The vessel sluggish in the terrific seas. Her hold is loaded with tons of Frederick Tudor's ice. Martinique bound. May never get there. In Tudor's cabin, the captain of the brig rages bitterly at young Fred. Be you do something about that ice in the hold before it smashes the innards out of my vessel, Tudor? Before I do something? Exactly what do you expect me to do, Captain? Uh, you wreck my vessel with your loony cargo. Did you go to sea for a life of ease or for income and a Gloucesterman's life? I'm no Gloucesterman. I'm in a mood for figures of speech, Captain. I'm in a mood to jettison your accursed ice. By Harry, that's just what I mean to uh, do. Just one minute, Captain. We'll capsize in this sea. Your slashing ice don't smash the hull to tinder. It'll turn us over. That is a chance we've got to take, Captain. That's brave of you to say, Tudor. Brave my responsibility to my men. You have a greater responsibility to all men. You talk mad. I will not let you jettison that ice. You'll have grave trouble stopping me. Wait. Wait, I tell you. Let go of my arm. I won't let you spoil everything. I'm master of my own ship. I'll have you know. You won't jettison that cargo. Won't I, though? No. Let go. Let, let go, I tell you. No. You're a rotten chains for this. Sit down, Captain. Let go, Tudor. Sit down. I warn you. Wait. I'll let you go, all right. That's better. You madman. Look, Captain, the lantern. The lantern isn't swinging as badly as before. Huh? We are riding easier. And war. Captain, will you will you just leave the ice in our hole for a while longer? Perhaps well, 
Perhaps the storm is blowing itself out. Well, I've, I've no wish to lose my vessel. And I, I've no wish either to lose my fee. And your cargo. If I can help it, Mr. Fluter. You will not jettison my cargo. If the weather takes a turn for the worse again, I will. If. I, Tudor, if. But the weather abates and holds fair. The great mystic river puts in at Fort de France. Martinique. Frederick Tudor hurries to St. Pierre, the largest hotel in Martinique. There, in the office of Monsieur Gaspard de Lille, Frederick undertakes his first sale of New England ice. Tell me, what will I do with an article like ice, Monsieur de Tour? Uh, Tudor, Monsieur de Lille, Tudor. Uh, altering your name does not alter my question. <laughs> uh, Monsieur Gaspard, you are a rich man. Merci. You have herds of cattle and sheep. Now, when grazing is bad, the animals die. They, they go to utter waste. True? Uh, very true. The misfortunes of waste. But if you had ice, you could slaughter some of the animals and preserve the meat until it was needed. Huh? And leave enough grazing for the rest of the animals. Mm, logic, huh? <laughs> you can preserve all perishable food with ice, right? In your hotel... You must appreciate the value of that, uh, huh? I can preserve food with this ice. Uh, mais dites-moi, how do I preserve the ice? With other ice? A matter of a few hours of digging and your men can prepare cellars to store the ice. Hmm. Tell me, uh, you have heard of this new confection, uh, uh, ice cream? Why, yes. I, have. I could perhaps uh, construct from your eyes ice cream. Well, yes. But... Bien, I will buy all of your eyes, Monsieur Dutour. Uh, Tudor. Uh, Dutour, Tudor. Yeah. Did you make ice cream, Monsieur? Among other things. <laughs> monsieur, have your men dig deep cellars, huh? I'll go back to the ship and arrange to deliver the ice. <laughs> Piling my ice in the dark like this under this blazing sun. Look at it. It's practically gone. And good riddance to it, I say. All the grief it's brought me. It's gone. Everything, all of Will's money, all of mine. I put your cargo ashore for contract. But I'm quit of it. Food spoiling, rotting, people sickening, and nothing left. Ice. Fool's cargo. Oh, you may think so, Captain. You wouldn't understand, but someone will. Someone must. I must find a way. And mark me, Captain, I will. I to say, be well soon. Send your friend a series of Hallmark seven-day cheer cards. You see, Hallmark seven-day cheer cards are just what the name implies. Gay, colorful cards that come packaged together in a group of seven. All you need do is mail a different card each day for a whole week. For instance, any adult or child will enjoy the Hallmark seven-day Get Well Express. On the first day, he'll receive an engine with a poodle conductor at the throttle. On each of the following days, other trains will arrive with a red caboose coming on the seventh day. The Hallmark 7-Day Express can be hooked together to form a long train of good wishes. Then there's the Hallmark 7-Day Zoo card for little folks. Inside each 7-Day Zoo card is a funny animal to punch out and put together. When you've sent all the 7-Day Zoo cards, the child will own a menagerie of cows and birds and bugs to send on his dresser or nightstand. Best of all, each series of Hallmark 7-Day Cheer Cards costs only 50 cents complete. Just look for the hallmark and crown on the package, the symbol that means 
you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Frederick Tudor. Heartbroken and despairing, Fred returns to Boston. He and Will are penniless, but by sheer eloquence and drive, he raises some capital again to try again. Not enough capital, for he spends more than he raises. The creditors frown suspiciously and close in. In the office of a Boston banking house, Frederick Tudor faces the hostile creditors grimly. You distrust me, gentlemen. You think I'm either a dreamer or a swindler. I reject both labels. Very well. Reject the labels, as you call them. But accept your responsibilities is all we ask, Mr. Tudor. You you call upon me unequivocally to pay up at once. At once or go to jail, sir. I must reject both invitations, but, gentlemen. Uh, Richard. Why, this is sheer effrontery and insolence, gentlemen. Now listen to me. Listen to me. When I tell you that I have found a way of packing ice in ordinary sawdust that cuts down melting by 60%. Sawdust? Indeed, sir. A chance, gentlemen, to save the ice and to make a good profit from a former waste product and nuisance from your sawmills. Mm, Furthermore, I have designed a warehouse, gentlemen, now being built in Havana with hollow walls for the storage of ice for long periods. Mm, That's where the money goes. And why not? In Havana, I also have an agent who has interested several customers in buying my ice. Yes, I have the effrontery to have spent your money, and far from being humble or entertaining any notions of guilt, I ask you to invest still more money in this project, worthy of the best instincts in every man of you. Mm, You've a silver tongue, Mr. Tudor, but... Then accept my words as collateral for further credit, sir. (laughs) Gentlemen... This fellow is either a monstrous swindler or a prophet. But I'm for taking the view that Mr. Judah here is so much in our debt anyhow that a little more can't matter very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. The money's raised. Another ship's engaged, heavily loaded with ice and cleared for Havana, Cuba. In Havana, Frederick goes to meet his agent, Monroe, and drives head-on into more frustration, further bitterness, worse chagrin, despair. Arrangements are complete, Mr. Tudor. The warehouse finished. Our customers eager to accept delivery on our cargo. Fine work, Monroe. Capital. There remains only the detail of... Um, my compensation. Oh, yes, the agreed-upon salary plus a bonus. You you deserve a bonus, I think. I think I should have half the profits. Yeah. I... I can't begin to pay a 50% commission. You know that. Nevertheless, Mr. Tudor. Oh, if I, I do, I... I can't repay my creditors. I, I've notes to meet or face action. They won't twice tolerate failure from me. I'll, I'll go to jail. If you won't meet my terms, I, um... I must withhold the names of my customers. Well, then I'll find my own customers. While your ice melts in your ship, sawdust packing notwithstanding. It won't melt in my warehouse. Uh, Mr. Tudor, it isn't exactly your warehouse. What? I've arranged everything in my own name, you see. I counted on you to do the right thing. As I now count on you. And do you call that right, my sacrificing so much that I'll be ruined? Do you? Take take 25%. Sorry. I'll, I'll be ruined. Very well. 25%? 40%. 40? Rock bottom. Look. Listen... Don't don't you see, if, if I fail now, I will never get another chance to do what I'm trying to do. Long ago, long ago, somebody I knew very, very dearly... No, never mind that. I, 
I've wanted to bring some ease and comfort to places that have steamed and baked in the heat, to keep food from the corruption and rot that sickens and poisons and destroys, to share the good of half a world with the other half in the simplest and the most elemental way I knew how, because I have no skills, no gift, no talent, just... You... You don't care. You're dead. You're cold to everything I feel. I just feel I've earned 40%, that's all. That's all. <laughs> Senor. Senor Monroe. I'm very busy, Manuel. What is it? Gabriel, your little Gabriel. Well, what about her? The fever burns now like fire. It has been three weeks. And now, Senor... I know it's been three weeks. Can't the doctor do something? The doctor sends for the priest. The priest? Tudor, you'll excuse me. Come, Manuel. Si. Monroe, wait. I can't stop now to listen to your... Monroe, I don't know that ice is much good for most fevers unless they've run on for a long time. Then it's it's almost the only answer. Tudor. Tudor, he wouldn't give me your ice. Why not? Now? After? Why not? What's your price? Well, isn't a question of price, is it? Isn't it? It's a question of stakes, of Gabrielle, other children, perhaps. Of course you can have ice for Gabrielle. Tudor, Tudor, I, I, I don't... We... we better get to the ship now. With packs of unfamiliar ice, Gabrielle Monroe's seething fever abates. The girl rallies. And two battles are over, hers and Frederick Tudor's. Fleets of ships will carry northern ice across the world for the use of humankind, for the steaming, baking places of Earth, for the food makers and the hunger fighters, the future microbe hunters, the health bringers, ice. It's years before the effect of Frederick Tudor's hard-won victory become evident before he receives a letter from the Surgeon General, Washington, D.C., which he listens to, eyes closed, as his brother William reads. And we find this impressive improvement in health in our warmer states to coincide exactly with the increasing use of ice in those states. Huh. Go on, Will. Uh, the reduced incidence of disease caused by food spoilage is astonishing. Most gratifying of all, perhaps, is the sharp decline of infant mortality. To these calculable gains must be added the immeasurable benefit brought by advanced medical and pharmacological techniques now made possible in the tropics by the introduction of ice. These conclusions rise from cold fact, but the gratitude of your country comes from the warmest hearts. Very truly yours, etc., etc. Office of a Surgeon General, no less. It's oh, very nice. Nice. You ought to feel very satisfied, Fred. You ought... Fred? Fred? Hmm? Well, didn't you hear me? Hear what? Say, where were you just now? Oh. In a garden in New Orleans. With Eugenie. Long ago. Long ago. Tudor eventually shipped hundreds of thousands of tons of his ice to 53 cities in the United States that had never had ice before. He brought the immense benefits of ice to the tropical world. Ice has contributed greatly in making us the healthiest nation in the world. Thus, Frederick Tudor, by his vision and his courage, deeply influenced our whole American way of life. Well, next week, on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, we're going to honor the father of film. And it's a fascinating story. I'll be back to tell you a little about him. But first, 
Here's Frank Goss. He wants to set the stage for a mighty important day that's coming up soon for millions of young people, including very probably some real ones close in your family. Do you recall the thrill you felt on the day you graduated from high school or college? The sun seemed to shine a little brighter. Friends seemed a little dearer. And the whole wonderful world was waiting for you to conquer it. Yes, graduation day is a day that belongs to youth. A time when all of us want to share in their joys and hopes for the future. Now, even if you can't attend the ceremonies of your young friends this season, there is one wonderful way for you to be with them. Just let a Hallmark graduation card speak for you. At the fine stores where Hallmark cards are sold, you'll find a host of heartwarming styles to choose from. Graduation cards that are exactly right for every boy and girl you know, including those about to enter a chosen profession. Yes, and here's something nice to remember. The Hallmark and Crown on the back of each graduation card you choose will carry an extra measure of happiness. For the familiar Hallmark means you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, graduation day is certainly a day to remember and to be remembered. And what a wonderful day it is for the young people and their families. With the regrets for the past that's over and the hopes and dreams for the future. But, you know, I always think of one other group of people, too, on graduation day. And that's our country's wonderful educators and teachers. What a satisfying day that must be for them when they see those happy and eager youngsters walk confidently off into the future. And each teacher feels inside, I've helped make that boy or girl a little better equipped to face the road ahead. I always remember a remark of Ben Franklin when some young friend of mine's graduating. Ben Franklin once said, if a man empties his purse into his head, no man can take it away from him. An investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. <laughs> well, well, say, before I get into a commencement address, I, I better get back to the next week's story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. We're going to pay tribute to the Reverend Goodwin, who, by his untiring search and discovery, open new horizons for the photographic arts. I know you won't want to miss that. Yeah. Our Hallmark Hall of Fame is every Sunday. Our producer director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by Milton Geiger. Until next Sunday then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Featured in our cast tonight were Lamont Johnson as Frederick Tudor and Whitfield Connor as his brother with Tom Tully, Ted DeCorsia, and Peter Leeds. Every Sunday Hallmark Cards presents two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. The Hallmark Hall of Fame on radio with host Lionel Barrymore and on television with Miss Sarah Churchill. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who in their own way have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we honor Reverend Hannibal Goodwin on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.